starting. Okay, Alan. Okay, okay. I think you can start. Okay, I'll take it away. Uh, as I said, I'm very impressed to see so many people here tonight. Thank you all for, for turning up. Um, I have to start this presentation uh, with a bit of an apology. You are the, the first group to see this presentation. Um, I did something similar a few weeks ago for a conference in Paris, but um, I always need to apologize when I do a presentation for the first time. Um, when, when, when I oh, somebody's my, my phone's getting in. Um, um, Karada, would you mind muting everyone? Maybe that will be just easier. No. I don't want to mute everyone because also Alan will be muted. But I, 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 you can unmute me. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to be easier. <laughs> Thank you. Please, Alan, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. So, um, yeah, so I, uh, when, when I first started speaking at conferences and meetups and things, I, I felt guilty if I repeated the presentation. I felt every group needed something new and original. Um, but over time, apart from the fact that wears you out and it's very tiring, um, I realized that when you do a presentation for the first time, it, it isn't perfect. You don't know where the jokes go. It needs a bit of debugging, basically. And uh, so, so the second or the third time is the best time to see a presentation. So you, you are the guinea pigs for this. So I apologize in advance if you, if you see the joins. Um, so, uh, but, but it also means you're, you're the first to get this, something, something completely new. Um, I have got a, uh, as you started, I wanna hit you with a, a couple of questions. Before I do so though, um, if this were a physical conference, I would do a book draw and give away a copy of my um, my book. I can show you it, it. It actually exists. There you go. You should be able to see that. That oh, I meant to switch off the virtual background. <laughs> we always have these problems, don't we? Instead, I stopped. Um, I stopped showing. That there, there you go. The book actually exists. I I've I, I've I've printed it. You you can buy it. It's not just an ebook anymore. Um, so I would give a copy away if we were physically together. I've worked out, if you go to that URL and uh, put in your email address, then I can do a raffle at the end. I, I can roll some dice. So um, let me put the, uh, I'll put that in the chat um, together with another link we're gonna use in a moment and um, the, the obvious question everybody asks. So go and enter your name in, in that book draw now and we'll draw at the end. Right now, Get on your browsers, because you're all on a browser. I know this. I know this for a fact. You're all on the internet. And go to menti.com. Um, some of you will have seen this site before. Um, some of you may be new. But it's a site that allows me to ask you some questions. So if you go to menti, then you should see a question. Are you using OKRs or planning to? Um, there's a code at the top, 11222379. Um, just click on your answer. Are you currently using OKRs? Do you plan to use them? Or no, you're not using them and don't plan to. There's eight, 90 of you in this meeting. So uh, let's see how close we can get to that. <laughs> it's a bit of fun, isn't it? Yeah. So I'm not really surprised that very few of you aren't using them or not planning to. I, I can imagine this talk has probably attracted those of you who are using them or planning to use them. Um, but it's interesting that the, the breakdown between currently using and planning to use is mostly the same, slightly more planning to use than currently using. OK, so. Um, Anyway, any last votes? Okay, interesting. Okay, one more question. Um, for those of you who are currently using them and have some experience, would you, oh, hang on, I need to go to the next slide and it won't, oh, uh, uh, if we go to the next slide, <laughs> why won't it go to the next? I rehearsed this earlier on today. And it, I, oops, how many of you would recommend them to each other? The great net promoter score. How many of you would, Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so there's a couple of people here. I, I'm, I'm not going to set out to change your mind about OKR. When I, last year, when I started to write down some notes about using OKRs, I thought it'd be two or three articles worth. Um, I think perhaps because of the pandemic, I wrote a bit more. And perhaps because when you start to think about them, actually, it kind of opens up and you realize there's a lot more implications, a lot more possibilities with them. So, um, so the book ended up being a bit longer, but okay, that's kind of interesting. So most of you who are using them um, would, would recommend them. Okay, let's go back to the main presentation. Thank you for that. It's very interesting to know. Uh, I've lost my area. Right, so we, we did that. Um, but before we get stuck into OKRs, we need to talk about the virus because nothing these days is, is free of the virus, is it? The virus is everything. And of course, I mean, the Agile virus. Uh, the Agile virus was first identified in 2001, although we have reason to believe it was circulating earlier. Um, what we have learned about this Agile virus is that it is spread by the use of digital technology. Before we had digital technology, there was no Agile. And the first people who uh, um, had digital technology, they, they tried to work in different ways. But gradually, the people who were most exposed to digital technology, the programmers, they started to, they, they got infected by this virus and they started to adopt different ways of working. Um, and as digital has grown, as more and more people have access to the technologies that 30 years ago only programmers had, Agile has got spread like wildfire. Um, if you think about it, you know, email, instant messenger, voice over IP, websites, wikis, programmers were the first people who had them. It was programmers, technology people who invented or thought through agile. I think what we're seeing at the moment is as more and more industries adopt digital technology as their primary way of working, agile becomes more applicable in more and more domains. Um, if you want to get the most from digital technology, you want to work in an agile-like fashion. You want to devolve power to the people doing the work. You want to give them the tools. You want to create feedback loops. You don't want decisions going up to the top and all the way down. There's all sorts of ways, which when you're working with digital technology, to get the most from that digital technology, you need an agile style of working. So we're seeing it spread in marketing at the moment. I expect we'll see it spread in the legal field in the next few years. There is good news and bad news about the Agile virus. Um, it mutates. You know, we're all experts on viruses these days, and we know the difficulties of mutating viruses. And the thing is, Agile is no exception. Agile mutates. And this is a good thing. And this is a bad thing. Agile can mutate and it can get better. In fact. I always say that um, if, you're, if you're working the same way you did three months ago, you're not really working agile. If you're working agile, it's about changing how you're working, it's hopefully improving. Sometimes you'll go backwards, but hopefully improving. So you should always be seeking to mutate and change the agile virus yourself for the better for your teams. But because the agile virus mutates and because you're allowed to modify it, you can modify it for worse. You can decide you'll have one sprint doing requirements, one sprint doing coding, and one sprint doing testing. You're allowed to do it. And because there's no trademark on Agile, you're allowed to call it Agile. So we've actually got two strains of the Agile virus. There might be more strains out there, but from what I see, I think there's clearly two strains of the Agile virus. There's one strain, which I started off calling mild Agile, but I now call corporate Agile. And then there's another strain, which we'll call radical agile. And most of those really great stories you hear about agile teams, about mob programming of no estimates, about delivering many times a day, they tend to come out of the radical agile. They're teams that are very rapidly learning, improving, changing, iterating. They've got the feedback cycles. That, that, that's the agile dream. Corporate agile on the other side, mild agile. This, this, this is, isn't quite asymptomatic, but it comes close. It's a weakened form of the virus. 
it's safer for your organizations to adopt. Um, you will still be better with corporate agile than you were before. I remember a few years ago, I was working with an airline and I was driving in there one morning thinking, I've got to fire these guys as clients. They aren't going forward. They aren't improving. I've become an obstacle. They, they need a different coach who can push different buttons. And, and that day I met a new BA. And he said to me, gee, I've worked other places that say they're agile and they aren't half as good as this. And later that day, I met a new project manager at the airline and he said almost exactly the same thing. A lot of corporations who adopt agile, they have a very weakened form of the agile virus, but it's still an improvement over what went before. It's not as good as the radical type of agile you find in, in the top performing teams, but it's still better than what went before. And in corporate agile, you have a very high R value. In corporate agile, there's a lot of emphasis put on reproduction. They are scaling it out, they're rolling it out, and teams are brought in and they're switched over to agile working. You have training sessions with 100 people in them. You know, the emphasis in corporate agile is getting agile out to everybody. But we're all used to thinking about R, but I like to think about E. What's the effectiveness of those teams? And in a lot of corporate environments, they've been very successful at um, spreading agile, at getting people infected with the virus, but the efficacy, the effectiveness of that virus is not as great as it could be. The effectiveness is left lagging because the organizations have put the emphasis on scaling. And there's some more reasons for that we'll, we'll come to. So common symptoms, you know you're suffering from corporate agile when you have three week sprints. I, I don't think I've ever seen a three wing sprint cycle that I would recommend, yeah? Um, you get lots of standardization and processes, corporately defined processes in corporate agile. And this is part of the reason why effectiveness lags in corporate agile, because agile is all about changing and improving and learning. And at heart, agile is about organizational learning. And the moment you start to standardize something, the moment you have common processes, common procedures across teams, you inhibit those teams' ability to learn and change. And so while you get a lot of teams with Agile in the corporate environment, because they're all kind of standardizing, they're, they're not very effective. Corporates can also be very keen on following the magic number seven, plus or minus two. Um, go and look at the research. Go and read the original paper, minus number seven, plus or minus two. It isn't there. This is just folklore, you know? I've seen teams of 14 be really effective. There's nothing magical about seven, but corporates will cling on to this number. And it's not uncommon in corporate agile to have mini waterfalls. You know, as I said before, there's one sprint for requirements and one for coding and one for test. <gasps> there's also a lack of trust. And the lack of trust leads to limited team authority. There's people are still scared of letting coding happen. I remember one particularly large bank in the UK a few years ago, I sat in a meeting for two hours with 12 BAs, architects, project managers, and a couple of people from an outsourcer while they decided what user stories they were gonna ask the outsourcer to estimate and then for the outsourcer to then build. And as this was going on, I realized that I knew more about OAuth 2 authentication than anybody else in the room. And I knew that although my programming skills have decayed, I'd written an OAuth authentication in two days. And all these user stories were about OAuth authentication. And 12 people sitting in a room for 12 hour, two hours was more time than it would take a coder to code. But in a corporate environment, that, that, that's still common there's still a fear of coding and there's a lack of trust in teams and in people. And that means the teams don't have very much autonomy. And when teams don't have autonomy, they can't experiment. And when they can't experiment, they're less effective. Why do companies do corporate agile? Maybe you've got some ideas on that. Maybe you wanna put some suggestions in the chat window. I, I can speculate. 
I think a big part of it is risk aversion. And this is particularly true um, just down the road from here in London in the city, the banks. No bank wants to adopt something first. They all want to wait and see who else is doing it. I heard of one financial institution the other day which even had the same carpet as Barclays. That their decisions on which carpet to buy was now influenced by what carpet other banks bought. Unbelievable. Um, so organizations look for other organizations like them and they want to copy them because they want to avoid the risk. And if you're, if you're a project manager in one of these organizations and you know your project is on the way to failure and you look around you and you see all your peers doing projects the same way and all their projects are gonna to fail too, then the incentive is to do exactly what you're doing now. If you do something different and your project fails, then you have singled yourself out and you said, look, I'm doing something different and I failed. You can fail, but as long as you fail the same way as other people, you're safe. So I think risk aversion is a big part here. Fear of failure, you know, as much as as agile people like to say, learn from failure and failure is normal. Do any of us like it when our kids come home from school and they've failed an exam? No, we're, we're hardwired to not like failure. There's this amazing faith in planning, which, which I was talking about a bit before my, my example. People believe that more planning will solve anything, so will solve our problem, and it doesn't. How many of you 12 months ago were planned to move to home working, to shut schools? How many of you, if 18 months ago I had said to you, prepare to move everybody to home working, prepare for schools to be shut, how many of you would have come up with a viable plan? And how many of you have still been talking about it? Planning's good, but it has rapidly diminishing um, returns on investment. Um, oh, there's constraints in the wider system. You know, we can't do things because the people that we answer to can't do things and the people they answer things can't do, go to. And ultimately the most powerful man in the world, the president of the United States is constrained, thank God, yeah? Um, and underlying a lot of this, I've already alluded to, is this is a lack of learning. Sending somebody on a one or two day scrum course does not teach them everything they need to know. And unfortunately, as you go up organizations, people are less, less prone to wanting to learn new stuff. They don't want to give the time to, they don't want to talk to them more. So there's all sorts of reasons why we get into this problem with corporate agile. The commoditization undermines the effectiveness. And when we undermine the effectiveness, we reduce our competitive advantage. Corporate agile is better than what went before, but we end up with a lack of motivation in staff. We end up with managers talking about how do we motivate our staff? How do we change programs? Never use the word change. Academically, you're, you're spot on, but nobody gets excited about change. Talk about improvement. Lack of fun. You know, the best agile teams are a lot of fun to work in. When was the last time in a corporate environment you saw people, you know, having, well, we haven't been in a corporate environment, have we? We've all been at home. <laughs> um, lack of experimentation, you know, lack of, this corporate actually it lacks the rapid learning. You end up with centralized learning. You end up with a, a, a corporate center of excellence, or better still, the consultancy you brought in to help you does all the learning and your, your people on the ground aren't. A lot of your administrative processes remain intact, your governance processes, your project management processes, your, your paper ordering systems, your single log on. Go away. It's better than what went before, but it fails in many issues. Okay, that's the problem we face. And maybe OKRs can help, which I think for many of you may come as a bit of a surprise that I, you know, having outlined this, and you know, I've outlined you know, the evils of corporateness and what could be more corporate than OKRs? Because OKRs are about management, aren't they? And, and I, I started off this way myself. A couple of years ago, I was working with a financial institution and we were, we were just getting their teams up agile and all of this. And then we were just told we're gonna to do OKRs. The organization wanted to do OKRs and it's like, oh, where did that come from? Did anyone talk to the, to the coaches on the ground? No, no, it's that centralized learning unit decided it. Um, 
And I was cynical about OKRs. And I thought, oh, OK, we have to go through the motions, but I'm cynical. And I got a surprise. They, they, they worked. And I found that um, OKRs offer an alternative to the project model. And yeah, some of you know, I'm, I'm one of the people behind the hashtag no projects. And you know, I can talk for an hour, more days, on why the project model and Agile are a bad match. And OKRs offer an alternative. OKRs offer a way of looking at the team, measuring the team, looking at the progress, but without measuring against percentage done, percentage time spent, percentage budget spent. OKRs are already established. They're like 30 or 40 years earlier, 20 years before Agile, but Intel use them, Google use them, even Bono uses them. Yeah. And, and they're liked by consultancies, those big consultancies who we, we all think are evil. They're not so bad, really. Some of you probably work for them. Um, you know, consultancies like them, they're friendly to organizations and they fit really well with Agile. Okay, I'll typically work on a 13 week cycle. So they're iterative and it makes sense to have a planning week or planning events at the start of that cycle and then 12 weeks of execution. So they're a bit sprint like. Okay, ours are outcome orientated. It's not about percentage spent or, or amount of percentage reusable code or anything. It's, it's what have you delivered? What is the outcome? What is the benefit? You can even think of OKRs as test driven management. In that, right at the beginning, we're going to write a set of tests. They're called objectives and key results. And these are the tests we are going to use at the end to see how far forward we moved. And actually, if you use them in the right way, OKRs are really supportive of independent units and devolving authority. You can, they can help push authority down to the people doing the work. And OKRs are um, failure tolerant. You're expected to fail some of your OKRs. So failure is always an option. But the problem when we say failure is not an option is, is we end up doing loads and loads of planning. So, I'm now going to talk about the way I see OKRs working. And I'm going to warn you here that some of what I say may differ from what you've read elsewhere. Um, that's always the case with Agile because Agile has lots of viewpoints. And I feel really sorry for people who are new to Agile when they realize that Alan Kelly doesn't agree with Yves, who doesn't agree with Jeff Sutherland, who doesn't agree with Jim Copeland, who doesn't agree with Esther Darby. And, and you know, and, whoa, and different points of view is valuable. And so I'm going to give you my view on OKRs. I know some of the books and some of the blogs I've read on them, I don't agree with. And I think you'll find the same thing. But you have to think for yourself and you have to work out which makes most sense from your experience and in your environment. So the first thing I'm going to say is, in my mind, OKRs embrace team autonomy. They enable teams to be more independent and more autonomous. In the olden days, we used to have a thing called management by objective. In fact, OKRs are descended from my management by objective. Management by objective was advocated by that great management guru, Peter Drucker, until Peter Drucker realized it wasn't a good idea and ran backwards. And with management by objective, the people at the top, the big brains, the planning units, decide what the objectives are and they pass them down to the next level people. And the next level people, the middle managers, pass them down to the people who are doing the work. And you cascade these objectives down. And in this model, you don't have much autonomy because the people above you have decided what you're doing and how you're going to be measured. And this is decidedly unagile. And at first glance, OKRs are management by objective reincarnated. But you can use them in a completely different way. Think of it like this. Your managers, your senior people, your leaders, those people at the, we, we say top of the organization. Let me challenge that in a moment. But those people who are charged with the big issues in the organization, they need to talk about the destination. Where are you going? what this organization is trying to achieve, what your purpose, your reason for existing is. Because there's because increasing amounts of evidence that shows the companies that target profit do not make the most profit. 
In fact, targeting revenue and profit is a bloody good way of making sure you underperform. You're far better off having a purpose and mission. So the leader's job is to talk about the destination, the mission, to paint a picture of a shining city on a hill that you want to go to. And they set out this vision and they should be ambiguous about how you get there. Because they then say to the teams, how can you help? You teams out there with your specialist skills, they support products and your, your specialist knowledge of our customers and processes and all the rest, how can you help? And in Agile, we may still have some middle managers, but managers are a lot closer to the teams. You know, a management type person is likely to be embedded with the team as they are remote. So our leaders set out our ultimate goal, our, our mission, and then the teams respond. And they respond quarter by quarter and say to the senior people, the leaders, this is how we can help. This is how we can move towards this. This is how we will contribute to the organization's mission. I don't even think of it as a hierarchy anymore. It's not, you know, John Smith is at the top of the organization. And there's layers of people below them. It's more like the solar system. The CEO, the senior team, they're the sun at the center of the organization. Ultimately, everything goes around them. They have to make the final decisions in many cases. They are the people who set the purpose and the vision and all of that. But then some people work closer to those leaders and some further away. You've got some teams which are like Mercury or Venus, and they're working, going round and round very quickly, and they're working closely with the leadership team. And you've got other teams which are more like Neptune, which is out there, perhaps moving a bit more slowly, but far more independent. Yeah. So these teams all orbit the people, the people at the center, not the top at the center. And they come up and they say, look, this is what we're going to do in the next quarter. This is how we're going to move the organization forward. This is how we're going to advance our product. This is how we are going to deliver benefit to the organization and move us towards that ultimate shining city on a hill. And they talk because everybody in this arrangement is a peer. Everybody's equal. It's not one person handing out instructions. It's not, even, it's not teams asking for permission to do these objectives. It's simply that your, your senior leaders and your customers are stakeholders in your endeavor. And so you're setting objectives and key results to to help those people in their goals in their objectives and you confer with them and you get feedback from them because feedback is good and feedback is very agile it's not the leader's job to say no you're not doing that okr it's the leader's job to say you know that okr is that, is that really contributing it's not what i was expecting and and to help the team okay so it's not top down it's not even bottom up it's more concentric circles so these leaders, the senior people, what about their objectives? Well, ultimately their objectives is to see the teams perform. The CEO is, isn't there to deliver a higher share price. The CEO is there to get hit their teams performing. And if all the teams are performing, all the teams are going in the right direction, then the organization is gonna do better, isn't it? You can devolve that authority down. And so, I like to think if the senior leadership team have OKRs, their OKRs are about supporting the team. Exactly. Supporting the team, show that leadership aided them. They're visiting customers, maybe they're increasing psychological safety. You know, your leadership team can come up with its own measurements. That's just my, my guess is what it might be. I'm, I'm also gonna say senior leaders and individuals don't have individual OKRs at any level. OKRs are a team thing. Yeah, as an individual, if you've got ind individual OKRs, there's, there's two ways they can work. Either as an individual, your OKRs build towards and assist the team OKRs, in which case your OKRs are superfluous. You are a team member. Your team crosses the finish line together. Therefore, the only OKRs you should be concerned about are your team level OKRs. Alternatively, your OKRs as an individual could be different to the team OKRs, in which case you've set up a conflict. You've now got an individual who is being asked to do something that doesn't necessarily contribute to the team. So except for some very limited circumstances, I, I don't think 
individual OKRs make sense. It's a bit like quantum physics. You know, at, at, at the, the macro level, Newton and Einstein's laws make perfect sense. But if you get down to the individual molecules and atoms, then no, we have to use quantum physics. So don't apply OKRs at the individual level. So your organization, your organization needs to have purpose. It needs to have a mission. And then OKRs come along. And while the, the purpose is telling you why the company is there, how you benefit society, and you may have one or more missions, the OKRs come along every three months. OKRs are quarterly. Every three months, you start with a blank sheet of paper. Um, Jeff Bezos has this idea of day one. Every day at Amazon is day one. I'm, I'm not sure if I go quite that far, but when you're planning your OKRs, it's day one. Don't worry about the sunk costs. If you've sunk costs and are not paying back, don't worry about them. Decision making is looking forward. Day one is saying, given where we are now, given the resources we have now, the product, the code base, the people, the whatever, how? Can this team, with these resources, move the organization along its path towards that mission? How can we deliver benefit? And you focus the next 12 weeks on doing that. And in 13 weeks time, you reset, wipe the sheet clean, start all over again, it's day one. So I think that means OKR should be supercharged in your prioritization. OKRs are giving you the measures for deciding what you're doing next. Think about your typical team. Where does your work come from? The backlog, yes. Support desk, people might be calling in with, with issues. You might be a DevOps team and you're having to deal with live issues on servers and upgrades. You may have a sales team in your organization who come along and say, oh, can you just put a new feature in for this client? Or I've just signed a contract over here. Can you build this? Well, yeah. And, Customers may talk to you directly. You may have history, not just technical debt, but um, the people on your team may have worked on other products in the organization. And periodically, someone from the other team shows up and says, can I just borrow Kate for a few days while she fixes something she wrote two years ago? Okay. And teams have trouble prioritizing between these things. The last thing we want to do is add OKRs. This is a big red flag. If you're doing all this other stuff and you just add OKRs, you're going to increase WIP. You're going to increase the work in progress. You're going to confuse prioritization. Yeah, I've heard of people who set OKRs as kind of additional projects for teams to do in their spare time. Not many teams have spare time. If we just introduce OKRs and we leave all this other stuff there, you're going to make things worse. So my suggestion is, that you make everything related to the OKRs. The OKRs are it. If you need to do support and DevOps, then you write something into your OKRs to reflect that. If you need to do sales support and talk to customers, you somehow acknowledge that in your OKRs. And frankly, if you don't need to do it, if you decide you're not doing something for the sales team, leave it out of the OKRs. And when the salespeople show up, you say, I'm sorry, this quarter, we strategically decided not to do anything for sales. We've consulted with the senior team in, this, in the organization, and they agreed with that. OKRs are everything. Don't get out of bed in the morning if you haven't got an OKR to do it. Everything is subservient to OKRs, which means you do have to think carefully about OKRs. And I agree there's a big business as usual problem. But you know what? Like so much of Agile, that problem being highlighted allows you to try and fix it. See, the problem is, and specifically with the backlog, what you do when the backlog, backlog says go right and your OKRs say go left, what happens when the backlog and the OKRs pull you in conflicting di directions? Which gets priority? So when I was working with OKRs a couple of years ago, one of the other coaches and I were talking over this problem and she decided to set OKRs by examining the backlog, thinking about what they were going to do for the next three months and crafting OKRs that described what they were going to do from the backlog. Not every item in the backlog, but the themes. And I come to the, the opposite conclusion that we shouldn't bother the backlog. We should decide our OKRs and then decide what we're doing. 
So we had a little experiment. And at the end of three months, we decided that her way was not particularly workable and she was going to follow my way. So my advice, throw your backlog away. Just get rid of it. Uh, I've been suggesting this for ages, but no one ever listens to me. So uh, maybe this time you will. The thing is, if you've decided to do something for your OKRs and it's not in the backlog, are you going to say, no, I'm not going to do it? Or are you just going to do it and write a new backlog item? Just because something's in your backlog doesn't mean you have to do it. If something's in the backlog and it doesn't line with the OKRs, you're not going to do it this week. You're not going to do it next week, next sprint. Maybe you'll do it next quarter if it fits with the OKRs. The backlog is superfluous. The OKRs drive. Think of the OKRs as a story generator. Instead of having a backlog of stories, which you intend to do, every time you need to know what more work you need to do, every planning meeting, you go to the OKRs and you look at the OKRs and you say, hmm, for the next sprint, what can we do that will move ourselves towards that OKR, towards that goal? And if you remember an old story, you might be able to fish it out, but you just write it out and you just schedule it and you just do it. You don't have a backlog, you have a story generator. And the OKRs are the story generator. And every sprint meeting, you look again at what you need to do. We have a tyranny of the backlog. In the beginning, even 10 years ago, let alone 20 years ago, the backlog was a damn good idea. And saying to somebody, hey, that's a brilliant suggestion for the product, put it in the backlog and we'll get around to it in a few weeks, was serious. Nowadays, when you say to somebody, that's a great idea, can you write out and put it in the backlog? You may well tell them to flush it down the toilet. You know, putting something in the backlog is tantamount to wiping your bottle with it. Yeah, it's pointless. It's where, it's where requests go to die. And in the last 12 months, it's got worse because in the last 12 months, we've killed the few teams that had a physical backlog. When you have a, a physical backlog, you're limited to how big it can be. Now that everybody has an electronic backlog, how deep is your JIRA? It just goes all the way down. It stories all the way down. We're never going to do the backlog, but so many teams are still backlog slaves. They are trying to churn through that backlog and they are being measured by their success on how much of the backlog they do. Everybody who calls me up as a consultant says, my team don't have enough velocity. We aren't getting through the backlog fast enough. A replenishing backlog is a sign of success, not failure. So put purpose above backlog. Think about what you're trying to do. Codify it in the OKRs. Um, somebody suggested this should be called purpose-driven development the other day, PDD. I think that's an excellent idea. What are you trying to do? What do you want to do? How are we going to add value for this company, for this society? And think strategically. So when you're doing your OKRs, one week out of 13, you think strategically and you decide what the OKRs are. And the other 12 weeks, you execute on that. Why is my click? I'm not moving on. Um, so ultimately, success is not hitting 100% of your OKRs. Famously, Google aimed for 70%, but success is not even hitting 70% okay, of OKRs. OKRs create focus. OKRs are a hypothesis is what is needed. Ultimately, success is whether your team added value, whether your team created benefit, whether you advanced on the mission of your company, whether you created a better society. Not whether you did 15 or 16 backlog items last time. Not whether you did 70 or 75% of OKRs. It's, is your team adding value? Are you moving yourself and your organization forward? And what we're saying with OKRs is every three months, we wipe the slate clean, we think strategically, and then we spend 12 weeks completely focused on that. Yeah. How bad could you go wrong? How bad could it be? Yeah, halfway through, if it's really bad, you could have bought and restart. But come on, we just need, sometimes we need to take a longer time frame than two weeks. Three months seems to be about right. Anything beyond three months, you don't know. Three months time, are you gonna be in lockdown? Are you going to be back in the office? We do not know 
what the world will look like in three months time. So if you've got a roadmap that goes beyond, uh, what are we, uh, March, April, May, your roadmap beyond June is very much a what if, is a maybe, it's a scenario. I hope that OKRs aren't a big bag reincarnation of management by objective. I see the potential with OKRs to really reawaken corporate agile and to get the fun, the excitement, the passion back in there and think about the purpose. Um, I started to put some videos on YouTube about the book and the themes in the book and so on. So ha have a look at them if you want. We'll do the book draw in a moment. I'll take a drink and we can think about some questions. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Alan. Just one one note from uh, from everyone. I'm uh, I think that there is some issue accessing to the form for registering the email. Oh no! Oh. Okay, let me check that on the other browser window. Thank you. Um. Anyway, uh, saying about serious stuff. Great talk. Great talk. Absolutely. Really love it. And um, just going through the chat, uh, there is one question from uh, Shannu. Shannu, can you unmute and make the question to Alan, please? Hi, yeah, sure. So, uh, Alan, uh, so far, I mean, it's a very nice, uh, uh, you know, knowledge that you are giving to us. Uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the backlog and the OKR bit, I was just kind of, you know, when you say that, okay, throw away your backlog and things like that, just thinking, isn't it like OKR becomes your guiding principle or kind of, uh, guidance to you know to because your backlogs are deep you have so many things in it so one of the way or rather the key way to prioritize it or to know that okay what are the things that i should be doing or adding to your backlog but until unless you have a backlog once you know that okay these are the prioritized list of items i must do because that, that is at a lower level right which a team takes up uh do you do you have a, a piece of paper on you when you leave the house with your name and address no. <laughs> house. How do you know? How are you going to find your way back? That's your own house. Yeah, it's important to you, isn't it? Yeah. You remember it. Yeah. Stuff that's really important to you, you're not going to forget. Yeah. And um, you, when you look at the, uh, the OKRs and you say to yourself, what do we need to achieve this OKR? What can we move forward on here? You've got a blank piece of paper in front of you. You say, look, we're trying to move forward in this, this objective with these key results. We have got, say you've got 10 weeks left to your sprint. We've got 10 weeks left. We've got a team of four people. What do we need to do? And your, your product specialists, whatever they're called, are sitting in that room with you. And they can talk about it and you can negotiate about it. Because there's some great, so when, when someone crafts a backlog item, they put it in there, particularly when they're, they, they put all the time into it of, of trying to um, specify acceptance criteria and making sure it's completely correct. You, you restrict the problem. You stop being able to blue sky think. You stop being able to think about alternative solutions. What you're saying to the team is, here's where we're trying to get to. Here's the resources and the time we have. What can we do in this time? Now, it may be that you've got some ideas from before, but you shouldn't be restricted by them. I, I want to rip away the backlog because in many ways it's become a crutch and it stopped us from thinking and negotiating. So mm. product owners, product managers, whoever, by, by all means, they can make their notes, they can sketch stuff out, but the team shouldn't be uh, beholden to that backlog. Mm. Okay. Got I know it. it's radical. Mm, it's quite radical. <laughs> yeah and especially when when we work at scale or say i mean as you, you started this bit as well right i mean first we have to be before the corporate agile virus bit say I, so how exactly this okr and, and when when we come radical at the team level and how do we percolate it or rather roll it up to you know at a if, scale if, level if, if you mm -hmm. can't if you can't get teams working don't worry about uh, scaling when yeah. you've got the teams working then think about coordinating them um I, most organizations I see who talk about safe, they're really just taking the first steps of XP. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. Thanks a lot.
Um, Alan, I had a question, uh, if I may. Uh, I typed it in uh, earlier, uh, and the question would be, uh, you know, what would you say is your biggest regret or a challenge in succeeding with OKRs and that something you oh. wish you could have done differently somewhere? What would I do differently? Um, while I try and compose my thoughts, I, I post an alternative link from the one that wasn't working for the book draw. I, I post an alternative link in the chat. Um, I'll post it again if, if everyone wants to try and get it. Oh, explain to the people in the waiting room, what's the point of that? Oh, it's supposed to go to everybody. Everybody meeting, let's try that again. Okay. Um, my biggest regret with them is I think I think I only understood the full capacity of OKRs after I was working with the team. After I after I'd done was it four or five quarters of, of with this particular team, and I started to put my notes again and think about it. I realised the implications of how far the uh, the OKRs really go, that it's they really are a strategic tool and the team need to think more strategically about that and it needs to be less of the itty bitty stuff. I mean, one of the things I say in the book is, is restrict yourself to three objectives. And later on I say, okay, if you hold my arm behind my back, I'll let you have four. And later on, I, I say, okay, so maybe you've got to have an objective zero. Maybe that's five. That's too many. And this podcast I was listening to the other day, and someone's about having seven or eight objectives. And the more I think about it, the more I think there's only really one objective. You, 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 you really want to narrow it down, get the focus, pursue one thing. And I think if I have a regret, it's that I wa wasn't even sharper on narrowing the focus. And also bringing in the senior leaders at an earlier stage to, to talk about the strategy behind it. Um, again, arguably, the team I was working with, we, we were kind of lacking a strategy. Um, there's, oh, there's too many strategies. <laughs> and we, we should have used the OKRs to flush that out. So, Alan, why wouldn't you, you know, shield your team from management OKRs? Uh, and, and, and I promise you this is my last question. Why shield you, the team? Uh, yeah, they, they just look into a backlog for next sprint, and that's pretty much it. And the product managers of this world would look into OKRs and our thesis statements of this world. Yes. Um, so story in, story out type of thing. Here, here's a hundred stories. Everybody take a story, do it, and don't bother anything else. Um, I, one of the things that strikes me as funny about developers is for every developer you meet who says, uh, I want managers to guard me from all this management rubbish, there's another developer who will happily say, management withhold information from us and don't tell us things. Um, I don't believe that narrowing people's vision is a good thing. I think everybody should be fired up by the purpose and missions of the organization. And just saying to them, here's a backlog item, do a backlog item, come back to me when you need another backlog item, only look at the backlog. I think that that is treating them a bit like children. That to me sounds like a feature factory. And I, I want people to think more broadly. I want them to think about the, the strategy. Um, there's a call I was on today with a new client and they were talking about the, the team don't get the commercials here. And I think the team probably do get the commercials, they're intelligent people. They maybe they aren't being given the chance or you aren't listening to them. Um, if people have purpose, if they understand it, they're more motivated. I don't want them to be a, a backlog factory. Now that has its limits because you do not want to spend all 13 weeks the agonizing and, and um, thinking about strategy and debating it. So and, you know, one week out of 12, go wide on the strategy, on the big thinking. At the end of the week, have your objectives and spend 12 weeks delivering them. Go narrow and alternate between wide, broad thinking, purpose related and getting down to narrow delivery. Thank you, Alan. And um, there is an another question on backlog from yeah. Jason Clifford. Please, Jason, can you unmute and make the question? Yeah, sure. Hi. Uh, so the question really is, um, how, how do OKRs work in an organization with large numbers of teams who need to resolve competing visions and priorities, but who are dependent on each other to do that? Uh, well, your problem is not OKRs. Your problem is dependencies, and you need to start blowing them up. 
We need to spend less time managing dependencies and more time removing dependencies. And the easy win for you is to throw away reusable code. Get away from your common platforms, move on to Amazon, divorce these teams. Reusable code, the cost of reusable code is immense because of the dependencies it creates. You need to work on making these teams independent. Teams will have some dependencies, but to a large degree, they should be talking to the teams they're dependent on and talking about their, their OKRs with those teams and what, what's needed. And again, those other teams, they have customers. Your, your, team, your team A, which is dependent on team B, for team B, team A is a customer. And team B need, need be thinking about that and they need to be prioritizing their customers. But inside the organization, you need to roll back on these dependencies. People talk about descaling the corporation. Stop, stop managing your dependencies and just get rid of them. Because no amount of planning is gonna save you. If planning was gonna save us, we would all be living in the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union collapsed 35 years ago. God's plan was the world's biggest planning department and the Soviet Union controlled the weather in the end to make it deliver its plans on schedule. And it did not work. We discovered the capitalist economy and the, the invisible hand of the market was a far better coordinating technique. And we need to move this message inside our organization, our big organizations where you've got tens of thousands of employees. We need to stop trying to get them to work like the Soviet Union and we need to start getting them to work like um, America. I know we're all Europeans here, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Thank you. Um, communication. Uh, I had some problem with the Chrome, but I was able to register using uh, a Firefox. So I think the link is fine. Um, now a question from Arthur about pivoting. Can you unmute Arthur? Yeah. Hi, Alan. How are you doing? Hello. Um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you a question about OKRs in terms of alignment. So one of the things that I'm interested with OKRs is getting that corporate alignment. Yeah. In my view, when companies aren't aligned, that's where you get waste within the value stream yeah. and people doing different things, etc. So one thing that happens in a lot of companies is change. And what happens mid-period where things change and you need to realign your OKRs. How do you see the OKR process working? So obviously, you know, you're in your 13 week yeah. process, but six weeks, everything changes and you need to rethink really about stuff. Yeah. So OKRs are selective blindness. OKRs are about saying, you know, we've spent a week deciding what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. We're going to put on our blinkers and we are going to execute on these. And to some degree, I mean, this is the same idea that was baked into Scrum. Do you remember when Scrum used to have, uh, you know, you, do, you only do what's planned and you have abnormal termination of sprints? Yeah. And navigating this line between dogged determination to do what you said you were going to do and responding to change is, it, it's not just in software. It's, or everywhere in life, isn't it? It's, it's a, and I don't think there are any hard and fast rules about it. I think if you are halfway through an OKR cycle and a pandemic hits, yeah. if the world changes, then what you need to do is you need to say, okay, break, let's sit down and plan this. Let's look again at our OKRs. Let's take our blinkers off. Let's look at our OKRs and ask ourselves, are these the right ones we should be dealing with now it's like um i keep reading stories about um pharmaceutical companies in the last year threw away all their development plans and focused everyone on vaccines which is mm -hmm. absolutely the right thing yeah. to do and you're going to have to make that call on an individual basis because the fact is if you do that every time if you are a proper fireman and you respond to every fire then your fires will get put out but all you'll ever be is a fireman yeah, you won't be strategic. And, yeah, and you've, you've got to find that balance for yourself. And unfortunately, large organizations can be bloody terrible at it because they kind of, they, they, they say what they value delivering on what's been asked for, but actually they really value flexibility. Um, now, there, there may be a way, yeah, 
there may be a way of building that into your OKRs. There may be a way of writing an OKR, one of your four that says, um, we will respond to any fires or we expect stuff. But partly this is going to be looking at your, your own performance. So, so one of the things I do with teams where we're using um, story points and velocity is every time they have to do a piece of unexpected work, unplanned but urgent, I call it, unplanned because you didn't expect it, urgent because you can't push it back. Yeah. Um, I traditionally make them put in a yellow card. At the end of the sprint, we count the yellow cards. And sprint after sprint, we can work out what percentage of their capacity is going on this unplanned but urgent work. And sometimes you can look at these cards and you can work backwards and you can kill them at source. And, you know, there's a lot coming from <clears throat> that guy always raises some, so we just got to talk to him. And um, another time you can build that into your planning. So the first thing I say is try and get a handle on it, quantify it. If it's ha happening regularly, then perhaps OKRs aren't for you or you need to phrase them in such a way. Um, I, I hesitate from saying move to a shorter cycle, which would normally be my sprint advice. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, the six week mark, is it really strategic if it changes in six weeks? It's strategic is about thinking about things that are gonna be reasonably invariant. Yeah, I mean, I also think, you know, there's a dichotomy here between we think about the Agile Manifesto and, and the concept of responding to change. And one of the things that we talk about with Agile is being able to do that. But then at the same time, we're also advocating practices where we're essentially locking something down between you know, 30 yeah, yeah. weeks. Yeah. And there is, there, is, there is a gray area in between those things. That's life. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I, yeah. I think that, that, that's a human condition. And yeah. we all need to find that balance. Somebody years ago, I had somebody on an agile training course and they said, look, I work for a pension fund that is closed to new entrants. Yeah. And it was the closest I'd ever come to a business that had no reason to change. Yeah. <laughs> um, but as I say, the problem is if you, if you're too dogged, then you never, you never really move forward. You just end up putting fires out. And may, maybe the solution in such a situation is to split the team in two and sacrifice one half to firefighting every 12 weeks. And the other it half can be firefighting as well, but it might be business opportunity. Well, you know, yeah. something might happen and then the market changes and then, you know, you can innovate and boom, yeah. there you go. So yes, but yeah, yes. Yeah. I mean, years ago, there's, there's a gentleman called Chris Matz, who's fantastic, another agile coach here in London. Mm -hmm. And he worked for a company and they did a deal with the sales team. There's a sales team brought in a deal, which was over a quarter of a million or something. They'd immediately start working on it. He just threw what they were working on away. Just yeah. roll, roll back to the last safe release and we'll work on it. Yeah. Okay. Thank I can you, see there's Anna. lots of questions there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, sorry, Arthur, Alan. but I want to give also room for other people. Okay, there is a, a question about how to introduce OKR. The, the first was from Lana, but there is also a similar question from uh, uh, an, another person. However, Lana, if you can unmute, you can make your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Good evening to everyone. Um, yes, I have a question like, for example, uh, I like the concept of OKR and I would like to try to introduce it to my organization. And uh, this is deeply traditional organization, plan driven, project mindset and all these things. And I'm just wondering what would be my first step, what I can do to start using this new concept, how I can introduce and get buy-in from stakeholders. Uh, what would you recommend in this case? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've thought about this question myself and I don't, I don't have a, great, a perfect answer yet. The, the nice thing about Agile was that Agile is a set of practices and you could kind of slip them in quietly one at a time. And as, as they made an improvement, you got more leverage. I think OKRs, you, you need to find somebody in a, a position slightly more senior than the team. So you need to get the team interested in using them for starters. Um, and you need to find somebody in a slightly more senior position who is going to give you the space to do that. And it's going to allow the team to say, look, we are going to, we're going to propose these, these um, OKRs. We're going to talk to you, the, the more senior person, about what they could be. And then we're going to try and execute them on, over, over 12 weeks. 
Um, so, you know, as always, start small, get an example that works, use that to learn yourself, use that to model to other teams. I think the smallest you're going to do is, is a team. So you need team buy-in and then you're going to need somebody who has a bit of authority to, to um, what's, what's the military expression, give you air cover, somebody to give you the space to do it. Does that sound like it might work? Yeah, thank you. I think it's, uh, yeah, I agree with you. I think it's important that all team has buy and then together you can try to move um, a bit more outside team. Um, yeah, thank you. Very good. Yeah, uh, Alan, just a quick question before proceeding with the questions. How long are you open to receive questions? Uh, I, 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 um, my, my family have accepted I'm not with them tonight. <laughs> they're, they're in the house. So I, I could go for another half hour. Okay, okay. Yeah, I think that we can stop before. Okay, we have another question from Shala Mamadova. Sorry for the wrong pronunciation, Shala. Can you unmute to make your question? No, mm, good evening. No, it's okay. You pronounced uh, quite good. Shahla Mamadova. Thank you. My question was um, for my organization, we have mission and vision uh, for overall organization. We have mission and vision for different squads, teams, uh, and we have KPIs, company-wide, uh, teams, team-wide. Uh, do we need to set OKRs as well, or KPI will be enough? Well, somebody was KPIs. telling me this the other, Somebody was telling me about this the other day, and to my mind, they're different things. To my mind, I, I, KPIs are a measurement tool. They are about measuring your performance, whereas OKRs are about what you're going to achieve. Now you could have an OKR that says, we are going to increase a KPI from 10 to 20. Um, I'm, I'm not, presumably you have some mechanism already within the KPI system that says, do you want to increase the KPI? But to my mind, a KPI is a measuring tool and OKR is a tool for action. So I'd just say, use the KPIs as a measuring rod for your OKRs. One of the things I, I say in the book about OKRs is you really want to quantify them. You want to think hard, but we're using the quantification, we're using the targeting mechanism to improve our thinking, to sharpen our analysis here. The problem is that if you, if you just always set targets which are numerical, people find ways of gaming them. Um, if you look on Wikipedia, there's a thing called Goodhart's Law, it comes from economics, and it says, um, any statistical measurement used as a target will change its behavior. And it was, it was talking about inflation. And we see that with story points. Story points have almost collapsed because we've been targeting them too hard. So I think you could set some OKRs around KPIs. You could use them as a targeting mechanism. Um, my worry would be that if you go too far with that, you'd actually collapse the measuring tool. People would find ways of increasing KPIs, which damaged you elsewhere. But maybe the answer is to go, go back. And you said you have a vision, you have a purpose. Maybe you want to step back and, and think about that vision, that purpose, and how you go forward on that. Um, what you do in the next 12 weeks to advance that vision. And maybe in advancing that vision, you will also improve a KPI. So um, I think the only way to know for sure is to try them, experiment. Okay, uh, thank you. And continuation of my question, uh, we have output KPIs and input KPIs. For example, for one squad, for one team, we set income KPI and uh, as an output KPI, and we set input KPIs like penetration, uh, churn ratio, and etc. In this case, um, should we use OKRs as well? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your input KPIs. I think output KPIs, fine. I could see how you could combine output KPIs with, um, with OKRs. But 
input KPIs, are you measuring like the, the effort, the number of people deployed on a team, the resources used? As a input KPIs, we usually use, um, for example, penetration ratio, how many customers use our product. Okay. Uh, yeah. Um, well, or what's churn yeah. ratio, how many customers okay. uh, yeah. leaving, and so, et cetera. Okay. So I assuming that your goal is to reduce the customer churn, then I think you could you could legitimately have an OKR about reducing customer churn. You might even couple it to an OKR that says, you know, reduce customer churn over the next 12 weeks. And then the team sit down at the start of the 12 weeks and say, right, what can we do to reduce customer churn? What what um, what benefits, what changes, what enhancements can we put in which will reduce the churn? So I, th I think you could. Um, you, yes, I think you just might need to be a little bit inventive, but I think you could. Thank you, Alan. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Shala, for the question. Uh, we have a question from uh, Ham Hamoud. Hamoud, are you there? Sorry, Hamad, my fault. Glass is not working. Hamad, Hamad Sumro. Okay. Alina, Alina, Alina Peltea. Hi. Um, you are very passionate about talking uh, of the virus on the corporate <laughs> level. Um, I could feel it in your voice. And I was wondering why do you think Agile happens at, in that style, at that level, and um, what we can do about it? Uh, well, the first thing to say is that the Agile virus is a good virus. There are a few, I know we've all been concerned with a very bad virus for the last 12 months, but there are, there are a few, you can look them up, there's some viruses which are very good for us, and, and Agile is like this. Um, I... <laughs> I took the metaphor from, um, there's a, where is the book? There's a, a book called The Living Company by a gentleman, a Dutch gentleman called Ari de Goose. Uh, and he was the head of planning at Shell. And his book, The Living Company, is all about the metaphor of the company as a living entity. And although we talk about companies existing to increase profits, the real purpose of companies is to continue to exist, is to not die, it's a living entity. And one of the things he talks in his book is, is the corporate antibodies that come in and, um, and try and stop any change. They, they see change as, a, um, as something bad. They want to perpetuate themselves. And I've also noticed that, and, and I think Scrum and investment banks are the best example I can come across here, in that investment banks are really hierarchical. And an invest a Scrum enters an investment bank. An investment bank thinks this is great because all the literature says Scrum is, is better, teams are more productive and all the rest of it. But what they don't realize is Scrum also has this self-managing teams aspect to it. And actually by letting Scrum into the investment bank, they've brought in a virus which is gonna, inf gonna run against the culture of the bank, the hierarchical culture. And that's why time and time again, in, in banks generally, but especially in investment banks, you see the bank get a high performing team and then it kills it. Usually the bank, there's, some, there's somebody in the bank who understands what's going on and protects the team. And they're either so successful, they get promoted or, or they get poached and then the team is killed. And it really is, Agile is really this virus that it, it just enters organizations and it creates conflicts in organizations. When, when organizations start using Agile, they start embracing devolved authority and self-organization. Uh, it, it creates tensions. And when you start to say, we are gonna be measured not on percentage complete, but on actual deliverables, it butts up against the normal, uh, the normal governance processes. And it disrupts other aspects of the organization. And so 
it, and it's sometimes it's successful and it spreads out and it really does feel like a virus. Other times, the organization just seems to round on it and, and kill it. It's like antibodies. Um, so that, that was where the inspiration comes. Those thoughts I've been having for, for several years, <laughs> but it seemed particularly topical at the moment. And it absolutely everything, every single thing you've said resonates with me a lot. I actually work in a financial institution. So what you said just there applies to the letter. Um, and I, I just wonder what is the end state where? Uh, well, I, <laughs> uh, I think a lot of financial institutions don't realize what they have let in when they let in Scrum and other agile methods. And um, I think that at the moment, every financial institution is trying to achieve agile, but not all of them are going to succeed. Undoubtedly, some of them will succeed. It's a lower numbers, some of them will succeed. Uh, I think most of them are going to fail in one form or another. I believe, um, I shouldn't name them, I, don't, I haven't worked there, but one of the big London banks, I'm told they're on their third or their fourth agile transformation. They have to keep transforming. But actually what's happening is outside of that, we've got all these fintech startups. So I was in a panel discussion a few, well, just before lockdown <laughs> um, with the CTO of Starling Bank. Um, those of you in the UK may have heard of Starling Bank. They're a big, successful fintech. I, I use them. They're great. And he said that Starling, they wrote the entire banking system in 18 months. In 18 months, they went from no banking system to a complete banking system. I know at least one large green bank in London, the average time to go from an idea to deployment is 27 months because they're battling their legacy systems. Agile, although you can use Agile with COBOL and all the technologies, Agile is really a technology of the post-Java age. And you can retrofit it, but it won't be so successful. And I think what we're facing is that the legacy banks are being outmaneuvered by agile fintechs using more advanced technology. And eventually, if some of the banks will go out of business, and I think some of them will just play by the fintechs. Most of the legacy banks have investment arms that are investing in these same fintechs. In the same way that IBM bought Red Hat and is now reinventing itself as Red Hat. I think we will see ABM Ambro and Barclays and Lloyds and all the rest of them, they will take, they will buy Starling and Monzo and they will become those banks. The legacy systems will just be left to wither. And um, organizations, the fact that there's lots of financial organizations which have similar attributes. The one I was working with a couple of years ago, although they're far from perfect, I think they stand a reasonable chance of making it. Um, so I think the smaller organizations, the ones which are newer, the ones which are less, less banks, shall we say, uh, no, less large, stand more of a chance of making it. But a lot of them are going to disappear one way or another. I'm sorry. Interesting thought. Definitely. Yeah, something it's to think about. It's capitalism. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alina. Uh, next question from Greg from Krakow. Poland. Nice town. I look forward to going there again. <laughs> Please, Greg, if you can unmute, you can make your question. Okay. Next one from Matthew Yogi. Matthew, are you there? Okay. So I would say Rinat Shagi, Shagi Sultanov. Um, hi. Uh, hi, hi, Alan. Uh, yeah, I'm calling from Denver, Colorado, United wow, States. Great. <laughs> well, I'm a big fan of your book. Uh, so I appreciate actually uh, um, having this up, um, option to, to speak to you right now. So my question is that uh, how does the uh, OKRs apply to the professional services firms? You may be a good example of such because we always play this dual role 
of a customer facing and then internal facing. So you, on one hand, you have to be take care of your own and develop your own organization and mm -hmm. move it in a certain direction. On the other hand, you have to satisfy your customers and be customer focused. So if you have a team that basically uh, works on a customer project or product, and at the same time wants to achieve the objectives for the organization, how do you fit uh, in these constraints of basically no more than three, maximum four KRs for the team for the three month period, or even uh, from the strategic yeah. perspective? What yeah. are your thoughts? Yeah, um, um, I so think- Adam, There is a similar, sorry to interrupt you. There is a similar question also from Chris regarding a contractual or temporary employee. Okay, just yeah. to- Yeah, okay. Um, in some ways, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna duck the question and boot it upstairs to the strategy department. <laughs> Uh, the, these are real questions. It, it, all OKRs do is focus the problem, don't they? Because the organization, with or without OKRs, has got to decide on a you know, almost daily basis, do you service the customer? Is it more important to bring revenue in from a customer account? Or is it more important to do something that will benefit the organization? And I think what OKRs serve to do is, is force that to the fore by saying, look, there, you really, there really are only so many things you can do in the next quarter. You, for, you force yourself to have a serious strategy conversation and say, look, in the next quarter, how are we going to set our priorities? How are we going to divvy up our time? Um, so I, I know um, I did some work with a professional services group and OKRs and they could set OKRs around servicing the clients better, making their own work more efficient. So there might be some win-wins there where there's a, um, an OKR about faster turnaround of a client engagement. And by doing that, um, the client is happier because they get a more rapid delivery and the organization is, is happier because they get to service more clients. And maybe by by forcing the organization to think through these questions, it will focus you on finding more of these places where you can get these win-wins. And it may be a case that you say, you alternate quarters and one quarter you have uh, more of a focus on your clients. And you say, this quarter will have two objectives around client deliverables and one about the organization and next quarter we'll reverse it. But you, you need, you will need to keep revisiting that question. Sorry, not a simple answer. No, I think that I like the idea of alterna alternating uh, and uh, uh, like refocusing on the specific objectives. I think that uh, the time period uh, um, is plays the major role uh, for the OKRs um, and uh, the way you think about it. Don't think about this as something as a permanent, as an epic in a sense like 12 month period, but think in the short and the relatively medium short term um, objectives and then yes. basically change it if you know, as you see it fit. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that's part of the reason I like the three month horizon. Three yeah. months is long enough to be thinking more broadly. Two weeks, and I'm a big fan of two week sprints, even one week sprints, it really is about what are we gonna shovel this week? Three months is enough time to think more broadly but it's not so far out that you're, you're, you're blue sky thinking, that you are, you're losing contact with what's what. And ultimately you, you can have missions that will take years, but you need to keep on revisiting them. I think every quarter feels about the right pace. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your question. Um, another question from uh, Valerie Wormster from London. Valerie? Are you there? From our furthest to our closest. Mm, no, probably no. Okay, from uh, Jovan, the next one. Jovan. Jordan the place or Jordan the person? <laughs> jo Jovan, like uh, the planet, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Jovan, I can see you. No, okay. I move to the next one. There are a lot of questions, uh, uh, so I have listen, to... Listen, everyone, if we don't get around to your questions tonight, please drop me an email and I'll do my best to answer them. I, I sometimes, I'll, I'll answer these as a blog post to, to multiple people. I can just find more time on it that way. 
Yeah, eventually we can also move part of the conversation to the LinkedIn events. You know that there is an event on LinkedIn. You can put your question there. We, we me and Alan are linked there. Yeah. So the next is from Richard Collins, again from London. Richard. Hi, Alan. Um, Hello again, Richard. <laughs> thought provoking as always. Um, my question really is around the extent to which OK, you think OKR sh should be negotiable. I mean, what happens if um, a team sets uh, an OKR that it likes, but senior management don't like? They don't feel that's actually going to take, uh, or, or, or to, and, I mean, we talked a bit about team dependencies already, mm. but, you know, in the real world, often there are dependencies between teams. And if what team, you know, team B is dependent on team A, but team A decides it's actually not going to do the thing that team B needs to deliver it, it's okay. How does that work in your view? So if you forget the title manager, those people outside of the team, they're stakeholders. Uh, they, they have an interest in the team and same as any other customer, you know, they they are the people you're setting out to satisfy in one way. When they are those kind of people with authority, they are also the people who are paying the wages of the team. And you know, ultimately, they are representing the investors in the company, the people who are putting the money up. And you're almost... <laughs> I hate, to, I hate to say it's back to communism again. You're almost back to, to the, the Bolsheviks and the czars. You know, it's, it's almost a situation of you know, the workers control the means of production. At the end of the day, there's no way you can force somebody to write code they don't want to write. But at the same time, if, if they write code without any reference to what their stakeholders want, week on week, quarter on quarter, sooner or later, the stakeholders are going to lose patience with them. And I would suggest that the scenario you painted sounds like a product owner failure. The product owner, the product owner is the specialist in understanding what their customers and stakeholders want from the team. The product owner is a specialist in understanding how the team will add value to the organization, to customers, to everybody who depends on them one way or another. And it's the product owner who should be spending their time talking to those stakeholders, understanding how they can add value and bringing that knowledge into the team. The other team members should be talking widely as well, but the product owner is the one who is the specialist by the skills they have and has the responsibility for understanding what is what is requested of the team and how the team adds value. So the product owner is going to be in the room and the OKRs are going to be set. So, you know, it's, I don't think it's a complete democracy in, a room, in the room. I think the product owner should be leading and saying, team, these are the things which our customers and our wider stakeholders will consider valuable. And I think the team should be proposing some ideas of their own, but that should be the focus of the conversation. Does that make sense? I mean, I think, I mean, what I think you answered my question indirectly in a way in saying that it's not just the team on its own making that decision, but that there has to be a sort of discussion taking place with a wider community in terms of what's going to work for you. Yes. Um, and I think that, and I think you can have some, in, I mean, I, negotiating sounds like it's a tussle, but it, it, it I mean, it, it's about having those. It, I mean, because ultimately, if you move away from simple metrics like velocity and start moving towards looking at things like value, value is always, I mean, there are two things about value. I mean, one is it's, to some extent, there's always a guess involved there. You can never be certain that you're going, you know, that the thing you think is going to deliver value is actually going to work. Yes. And the other thing which you've not talked about, or it's come up in the questions, is about the lag factor that often value takes time to manifest yes. and people's initial reactions yes. to things is different to what it is downstream and it can go either way. I mean, I don't know. I mean, uh, of, yes, of the okay, so but... the, lag, the lag factor, <laughs> okay, I'm caught out, I'm tripped up. The lag factor is 
is the big elephant in the room, which none of us in the agile movement or even wider business tend to get to grips with. Um, the fact that we love talking about business value and we love talking about improving things. And you know, the idea that you can roll out a delivery, you can measure the next day you've got more visitors to the site is perfect, isn't it? <laughs> but the fact that often you need other things, you, you need you know, a marketing campaign, you need to train your users. And I don't know if you know this, but you know, in the 70s and 80s, we invested an awful lot of money as a planet in information technology. And it did not show up in the productivity statistics. It did not show up in the GDP. It didn't show up, in fact, until about the year 2002. And we have very, in some cases, we have very long feedback loops on these things. Mm -hmm. Now, I think part of our mission in Agile is to shorten those feedback loops. But we will never completely close them. There's always going to be some judgment involved here. Um, and... The other thing we, 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 I should own up to is that, you know, I talk about adding value with OKRs, but sometimes you do your damnedest on OKR. You get to the end of the quarter, everything's perfect, but you can't measure for six months as to whether it genuinely yeah, added yeah. value or not. And um, that, that I think deserves a whole of the book on its own. <laughs> well, I think it, I mean, it's partly, I mean, I, I gave a little talk at Agile on the beach about should we be doing Agile slower because of that, need to learn yes the fact that there is hysteresis in the system you know things don't change immediately um i was I mean, I just i'll stop now but just had a very interesting i was talking to a chief exec of a uh, a charity that i'm working with about them becoming more agile and she was very into it and she introduced the idea of what we need is more space you know, we need more space in which to see whether things work we need more space in which to fail we need more space to give people budget to do experiments. Yeah. Yes. And I thought that was a really, I thought yes, yeah, that's a really interesting idea. Yeah, um, I mean, there, was, there was something I was doing the other day, and I, I was rest, the same idea of space. You just need to give people the time, the space, the resources, the physical space in some cases. Yeah, yeah. And um, unfortunately, another thing we do badly in Agile is we like removing waste. And a lot of those things which constitute the space to do experiments, looked at with a different pair or different hat on is waste and we strip mm -hmm. it out. And we've seen yeah. a lot of that. We saw a lot of that um, during the pandemic where organizations didn't have the slack to, to absorb changes. No, I agree. Well, thank you very much, Alan. That was a really interesting, thought provoking session and uh, some you. good questions as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question, Richard. Um, Eve from Belgium, it's your turn. Hey. Um, I, w I wanted to react a little bit, Alan, to your answer that you gave uh, earlier on to, to Lana. You talked; she was asking about the, the churn, and you talked about that the churn could become um, an objective. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder: is it, wouldn't it be better that the objective is more, I don't know, some more customer related, like have more customers, and then have the the churn as one of the different key results? Like okay, have limited churn in, as a key result, and then another for another key result for new customers. Or how do you feel about that? Um, I think with all these things, the deep more you think about it, the deeper you can get. I think you, yeah, you, yes. <laughs> I think we you could hypothesize that customer churn is not satisfying to a customer, either because they've joined and then decided to leave, your service wasn't good enough for them, in which case you could hypothesize that you could be offering a better product to them, or you could hypothesize that customers were joining your service, not completely understanding it, and therefore you could, you could make it clearer what they were getting into, and you could reduce churn that way. Um, and I, what I like about the churn thing is that it leaves both those avenues open. You can say, okay, we, we want to reduce customer churn. Our hypothesis is that um, customer churn is a sign that we're losing customers we could potentially keep. But the team would have the authority to look at it and say, you know, given the data we now see, we look at it, actually, we've got a lot of customers coming who want something different. And actually, the right thing to do 
is to add value to the customers by helping them choose not to use us. And therefore, we will save resources and we'll be able to focus on the customers who do want us. So um, it, one of the things I was saying is that I think you shouldn't set OKRs in a hurry. You should allow time, perhaps even a whole week to set these things, because I think there are different ways of looking at them there. And I think it's brilliant you, you've picked that one up because the way Lana presented it, what she presented, what she had was different from my initial impression. And then you've added another take on it. And this is one of the powerful things about trying to boil this down to numbers in that you force yourself to explore those ambiguities. Yeah, my, my experience with OKRs is also that it takes like three rounds of defining them. The first time you do it, you spend a lot of time and you think they're really good. And then three months later, you look back and they think, no, they were really crap. And now we had got it. And then you do it another time. And only by the third or the fourth time, you actually have things where three years later, you can say, yes. oh, these were actually good. Yes. yes. But we need to go and do that multiple times. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, with three month cycles, I guess you could perhaps do six week cycles for the first few times. But as I said before, that's not particularly strategic. So I think, unfortunately, while you can reduce the sprint from two weeks to one week to build up that that experience quickly with OKRs, the, the three month limit is going to be a problem. Yeah, but if you look now that most companies only think like once a year or maybe every five years strategic way. So every three months is already way ahead of most other companies. True, true. I think that that shortening time scale is going to become increasingly necessary. You know, as we look at the the exponential trends that are all starting to converge, I think any organization that's that's looking as you say, kind of beyond that three-month time horizon is already trying to predict the future too far out. Uh, and I think you're quite right, COVID has taught a lot of organisations a very painful but necessary lesson. Um, and, uh, you know, when I'm, when I'm kind of teaching agile thinking classes and things like that, you know, whether I'm trying to convince an organisation that you know, they should be more agile, you know, it really comes down to fast feedback. You know, that, that's ultimately what all of this is about. And that is, you know, does the problem think you think exist actually exist? You know, is this, if we're talking about OKRs, you know, is this objective actually the right objective? You know, are we, are we measuring the right things? Have we got the right needles on the dashboard? You know, Ultimately, all OKRs are a hypothesis about what you yeah. think will move the needle. And as Richard was pointing out before, some of those fierce, fast feedback loops are damn difficult to get fast. It's, mm -hmm. uh, the analogy I draw is at the moment, it, during pandemic, I've gone back to buying a physical newspaper and reading physical books. And actually, I like the, the structure and the slightly slower pace of reading a physical newspaper. And it's about working out what are the right cadences for you organization at this time and place. Isn't there a book, Thinking Fast and Slow? Yes, yes. And most people don't get past the first few chapters, but I did get to the end. It's, it's worth reading, although most of the insights are in the first few chapters. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, I also think, uh, you know, from, I'm a SPC for my sins. Um, and think about things like innovation accounting that they talk about. I mean, I know SAFE gets a lot of stick, but there's a lot of, a lot of good advice in it, I think. Um, and looking at, you know, a lot of these indicators do lack, and I'd put it into the, the comments earlier on. So trying to find the things that are the leading indicators, try and find the things. And again, it's all a hypothesis. You know, if we can move this indicator in the right direction, the lagging ones should follow further down the line, you know, and kind of measuring that causal chain as well and trying to get better at figuring out what that causal chain is so that you can do the faster feedback. Yes. And, 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 yeah, allow the leading indicators to follow. Um, a couple of people text me to say that they're, they're going to drop off. So I think we yeah. better do this book, book draw before we lose you all. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, Alan. I was just writing to you. Yes, yeah. we, we have a few more questions while we will move to... Leading. Let me quickly do the draw and then we'll go back to questions. There's 93 email addresses. So can you all see these two dice here? Yep. Google has 10-sided um, dice here. So I'm going to roll them. And since we've got, hopefully it'll be a number between one and 93, 
And uh, okay, this is the draw. Are you ready, everyone? Yep. Yes. Number eighty-three. That's good. So eighty. I've got I've got a list in front of me. Eighty-three is ooh, Katajay at Katty dot at gmail dot com. Katty J, are you still online? Are you online? No, I cannot see the name in the list. I'll drop him. I'll drop him or her a, a list. Um, so I said I give one ebook and one physical book. Um, should we do one more roll? Yep. Okay. Three, two, one. Uh, go. Forty-five. So. Uh, uh, okay. Forty-five. Madhav Deze. Mad have not in the list. Uh, not in the okay. Um, so shall I just email the two of them and say they've won? Yeah, yes, okay. they were there. Yes, okay. I I've got them. I'll take out. Okay, shall we go back to uh, our, our questions? Who, who's left? Who's still got a question? Okay, actually, there was uh, one question coming from Stephen. Let me, Stephen, looking for. Steven Smith from Devon. Hi, Alan. Thanks, Carla. Yeah. Hi. Um, just a practical thing. You talked about the removal of um, the removal of the backlogs. People could be quite attached to those. So how, oh, yes. how have you kind of done it? And I've started. How I can't quite see how you'd start with a small experiment on it. So if any insights that would be useful. Thanks. Just ignored it. We didn't actually set fire to it or delete it in Jira. We just, we just kind of said, you know, the, the OKRs have um, priority over the backlog. And we are going to pursue the OKRs. So when we sit down in our first planning meeting and subcommittee planning meetings, we talk about what we can do. And if somebody remembers there's a story in the backlog that will help here, we fish it out and we'll talk about doing it. If there's not a story in a backlog, well, we'll just magic one into existence. Because if you didn't have a backlog, that's what you do. Um, and um, the, the only catch then is, well, what if you create a duplicate of a story that's in there? Well, if you create a duplicate of a story that's in there and somebody realizes before the end of the sprint, the end of the quarter, you can look at it and see whether you can tick it off as well. Or you can just say the new one supersedes it or most backlogs are full of duplicates and the world doesn't end. So you don't necessarily need to actually delete the backlog, you just need to give priority to the OKRs. Yeah, and just ignore it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. you know that. Secretly know ignore that. it. Stealth. Nobody else. <laughs> By stealth. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, one last question because we, we have to go to our family. Uh, from Will Ray Jonen, I hope that I pronounced this correctly. Bill? Close enough, close enough. Hey, Alan, thanks. Uh, of course, every movement has to have a better name. So what's the hashtag or how, how you, uh, how you uh, market this? No, no, I'm not. You're, you're not going to catch me out there. I am not going to say hashtag no backlogs. <laughs> I, I was caught out with that with no projects movement. But um, that, that I tried something without no. <laughs> yeah, something without no. Um, so. It could just be OKRs. Uh, it could be hashtag agile OKRs. Maybe, as I said, you know, I've listened to some blogs, listened to some podcasts, read some blogs where the description of OKRs sounds a lot more like management by objective. So maybe, maybe this is agile OKRs. Maybe that's how we differentiate these type of OKRs from the more management by objective types. Or maybe we say, Hashtag reawaken agile. Maybe there's some other ways of doing it without uh, using a different technique. What do you think? I don't know. But also, often I feel that it has to have a different slogan than the normal one because OK is OK and there's many types of them. So, so yes, yeah, yeah, I, 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 of them. I think you're on to something there. There are, there are OKRs and then there are the way we can interpret OKRs in the Agile setting. Um, but the problem is if we differentiate them too much, 
they lose that comfort value of they came from Google, they came from Intel and, and every consultancy likes them. Uh, you, you like Scrum, you want to pull off that trick of looking cuddly, letting, letting the organization take them inside and then you, you, you kind of show your true colors. <laughs> that, that's cool thing. I, I'll let you think longer for it. <laughs> okay. Smarter OKRs. Smarter, okay, I like it, yeah. Okay, I think that we can close this session, this amazing session to, to let you understand uh, I really take a couple of learning today. First uh, is uh, at 100 because actually we touched the limit of uh, the subscription in Zoom. So thank you for that. And another uh, quote that I'm taking from the chat is uh, celebrity agilist. It's another quote just referring to you. So this is just to say thank you, Alan, for sharing for these insights. And thank you all of you for being part of this uh, event and be so proactive and active in, uh, in the questions and uh, in creating insights for all of us. So I hope to see you, Alan, in one uh, event in future. So, yes. you, you know, our door is always open. And for you members, I hope to see you next week to our next event and in the following one. Well, um, everyone, Agile on the Beach is happening in September. So book your tickets soon because they're going like hotcakes. <laughs> That's a good point. Okay, thank you again, Alan. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Goodbye.